Okay, welcome to the next episode of the Value Prop Show, Investing in APAC, brought to you by the Pacific Basin Economic Council. My name is Michael Walsh, as your usual host for proceedings, and today we will be taking a brief diversion away from a focus on APEC countries to a regional and global service sector that works closely with the high net worth individuals, corporations and family offices, the movers and shakers basically, um, within the region. So I'm delighted to welcome Joanna Khan, who is a qualified solicitor uh, in New Zealand and in Hong Kong. She practiced for 13 years and was previously a partner for international law firm Herbert Smith Freehills. In July 2020, she made the career jump to be managing director in Hong Kong. And Joanna has spent her entire career helping clients protect and grow their assets, whether through on or offshore corporate, trust or foundation structures. She also has experience and expertise in pre IPO planning, pension, and other retirement planning and philanthropy. She normally acts for individuals, families, single and multifamily offices, and intermediaries looking to assist their clients. And Joanna is familiar with most Asian jurisdictions, as well as those further afield, which are also of interest to her clients, including the US, Canada, UK, Europe, and the UAE. Joanna is also presently the Deputy Chair of the Society of Trust and Estate Planning in Hong Kong. So welcome, Joanna. Um, as we get started, obviously, just before we were coming on air, I see and obviously uh, welcome you from London. So you managed to make it out of Hong Kong and back to London, uh, even though there's a lack of flights, it seems, and also uh, some of the ongoing quarantine restrictions. So perhaps in your introduction, what brought you back to London? Was it family? Was it business? A bit of both. And are you able to continue to service your clients without issues uh, in any time zone, which seems to be part of the norm these days. Um, so if you could, if you could just give us a brief introduction to your own background, in addition to what I've just mentioned, and how you got into serving, in particular, the high net worth individual segment and family offices, and share a little bit about your passion uh, in your given sphere. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks, Michael. Um, so I am in the UK at the moment. I'm visiting my parents, my family, because like a lot of people who've got family overseas, um, it's been a while since I've seen them. And, um, you know, one of the things we were talking about before about, you know, how is the world changing sort of post pandemic? I think one of the things we're going to see is that um, previously families who would spend, you know, a week at this summer house and a week at um, that place and then head on to wherever after that are going to spend more time in one place. I mean, for myself, okay, for an extended period, And so, you know, there would obviously be no point traveling somewhere for three or four days for a work trip as we might have used to do, if you're going to then have to travel. Um, so then going to have to spend time in quarantine afterwards. Um, so look, I got into this area of help of helping high net worth families, because although it sounds like a cliche, I really like helping people. And so I was very fortunate that my first job out of law school was for a New Zealand law firm that specialised in helping um, high and ultra high net worth New Zealanders and expats. So, um, you know, they're a very, very um, reputable firm. They have an amazing uh, base of in local and international clients. And at that time, New Zealand as a jurisdiction was very attractive to foreigners um, because the Inland Revenue Authority was very... Um, it was very tax neutral, I suppose, for people who were resident outside the country. And I've just found that, um, you know, high, net, high and ultra high net worth families are the same as every other family. Um, they have the same internal politics that go on. They have the same um, hopes, desires and dreams for their children. They have the same desire to help um, their communities. So it's just fantastic to be able to help um, families achieve those goals and, and resolve any issues that they might have. That's great. I mean, uh, prior to my APEC and ABAC and uh, PBEC experience, which has been nearly two years now, I was obviously uh, 
also helping families more about their travel needs with the private aviation industry. And I agree with you. It's really, I feel like it's a privilege sometimes to be able to speak to these high net worth individuals, understanding and uh, coming up with the right solutions because every, you know, every need is different, right? All it has is different nuances, how people like even their food preferences, et cetera, and who they like to travel with, who they don't want to travel with, um, et cetera. So it's, it's always nice to hear somebody else say that it, you like to just help people. And I, I, I feel similarly, it's like, you know, finding out the problem and then finding the solution to the problem and letting them feel satisfied that we find the right solution for them, uh, even if it's sometimes bespoking it. So with that, um, you mentioned, or you actually put pen to paper recently on an article on the 10 domains model as part of the growing recognition within your industry that clients expect you to not just provide professional expertise in financial, legal and tax planning, but also to have the knowledge and awareness of other areas of interest to a particular family office or individual client needs, such as what I just mentioned, maybe uh, a business jet asset, a yacht, uh, also, you know, other investments, right, which are non-tangible per se. Um, so can you share why you feel this model in particular is an important parameter for wealth management experts like yourself to engage with family offices and perhaps share an example where this has worked for you? Absolutely. So I think um, for those who don't know that you should definitely have a look, look at it's uh, published by an American organization dedicated to serving ultra high net worths. But the 10 domains not, uh, model basically recognizes that people are holistic beings with more than one need. So um, essentially what they're saying to, for example, tax planners and tax structures is yes, tax aspects are important to me, but I can't forget the fact that, you know, I have other drivers and needs. So for example, you know, I want my children to be educated um, in a particular country or my children have a desire to be educated in that country. So while it may be on the, you know, seemingly tax inefficient for my children to be in that place, that's where they want to be. Um, you know, the, the sort of old English example, if you like, would have been people who wanted a house in the south of France where they would perhaps spend more than the tax free number of days. You, you might say, well, why would you go there? It's a high tax jurisdiction. But people aren't just driven by economic factors. They're driven by personal factors, too. So what this model says is just remember that if you want to best serve your clients, you need to be alive to every aspect that is arising for them and recognize that, um, you, that, that it's not just about, say, for example, financial return. Um, and an example I've come across in my practice uh, when, I was a, when I was a lawyer was, was absolutely fascinating. And the discussion between... Um, uh, unfortunately, the father had passed away and the discussion between his children was what did uh, success looked like to their father? And the reason this came up was that they had a manufacturing business based in a particular area of China um, that where manufacturing in this sector was moving to other jurisdictions. China was no longer as attractive as it had been. And the question within the family was, had the father set up that the business in that place because that was where he was from? And so he saw it as his duty to provide employment for people from his hometown? Or had he set up there because it was the mm. best place in terms of economic return for the family? And he would absolutely have closed the business down there and reopened it somewhere else now that the economic circumstances were changing. And to be honest, I don't know that there was a right or wrong answer to that question. Um, I think the father would probably have considered both and ultimately made a decision, you know, one way or the other. Um, but it, it's just an example that you can't just be looking at, you know, what are the economic returns, um, you know, and, and you know, what, what are, or, or even, you know, what, how do we support the local community? Because there are multiple ways of achieving both. So, Obviously, you know, we sit here midway through 2021 already um, and COVID has kind of upended multiple sectors, as we've seen. I mean, whether it's for good or for bad, I mean, from my own uh, past experience in aviation, it's been absolutely horrendous uh, and still a way to go. But, you know, others have taken advantage of this, uh, you know, this situation and pivoted, uh, been quite nimble. Um, so 
you know, in terms of your conversations with your clients in that respect, you know, your high net worth individuals and ultra net worth, have you seen some uh, new trends emerging from all of this uh, or has it been business as usual, like really no, no real concern? They're kind of taking a long term view. Um, okay, Michael, good, interesting question. I mean, I think, again, it depends on the family or the individual. So as I said, a lot of families are looking at where geographically they base themselves. And I think, you know, even for um, look, people in a sort of more normal uh, sphere of society, anyone who had children in boarding school, whether it was the US, Canada, Australia, um, UK, last year had an absolutely terrible time suddenly thinking, oh my goodness, I'm cut off from my young children. Um, I had a friend in Hong Kong whose daughter was essentially being told that she had to leave her boarding school in the UK and she nearly ended up staying with my mother who she'd never met um, because her father was simply unable to get her flights back to Hong Kong. Now fortunately she was able to get back in, you know, without any issues. But these are issues that affect everybody. Um, so you know, I think from that perspective, from the personal perspective, people we got very, very used to an interconnected world on a, on a physical level. And what we've now learned is that the world is just as connected, but virtually now. So I think, look, I think unfortunately for your former sector, aviation will change. I think people will think twice before traveling, at least in the short to medium term, um, particularly as lockdown rules can change uh, very, very rapidly and, you know, without much warning, so it makes life difficult for people. Um, but I also see, I do see some of my clients, particularly, as you said, you know, mentioning some business sectors. So, you know, obviously, for example, at the moment, um, biotech is booming. So I've got um, families who are in that sector who had been thinking about IPOing or thinking about, you know, selling, for example, and suddenly valuations are through the roof. And a plan that might have been, as I say, three to five years away to IPO or sell is being brought forward. Um, I've got other families who are in other industries. So um, a, a bulk dry goods carrier uh, <laughs> client. So they, they run ships um, and they've had an incredibly tumultuous year um, in terms of, you know, where things are going, costs of everything. Um, but I think one of the things I've been reading this week is, um, so the economist in this week's issue has got a big feature on the amount of money that's going into green and sustainable um, uh, tech and, and industry and, and everything. And, you know, so what they're saying is, look, that's going to have an impact on most commodity prices, you know, rare earth metals, um, all the materials that go into those kinds of kinds of um, uh, technology, um, you know, that's going to have a long term impact. Um, then there's, you know, things like, okay, so what about oil and gas? And we've seen the recent um, shareholder activism with oil and gas companies. Um, so there's a lot of changes happening, um, partly as a result of the pandemic. But I think once you have one tumultuous event happening in the world that kind of changes the way people think suddenly a lot of other things uh, fall into place as well so look so certainly I mean we are business was very good for us last year um, so far it's tracking to be very good for us this year as well um, but it's about listening it's about sitting down with clients and saying okay look we can structure for where we are today but we need to make the structures flexible because if three years ago or even two years ago, I had said to you, this is what the new normal is going to look like. You'd have probably had me locked up. Um, you know, no one would have expected this. So I think that's what we have to be planning for now. No, certainly. And with that, obviously we were talking about risk profiling as well on their portfolios in particular, or, you know, what they're potentially looking to do in their decision making. Um, have you seen your clients becoming more risk averse as a, as a consequence? Like they want to wait and see because there's so much happening or, you know, again, it comes back to the individual or family that you deal with because some maybe 
riskier than others, correct, right? No, absolutely. Um, I, I would say that economically, most of them, so in terms of their investments, most of them are um, quite positive and quite upbeat. Um, and I, I mean, obviously certain sectors less, less so and, and clients who are in those sectors may be looking to get out, but also to consolidate. I mean, one of the great things about family owned businesses is they tend to be less leveraged than non-family owned businesses. So they do have dry powder either because they've got you know, cash or because they've got the um, opportunity to borrow in this incredibly low cost environment at the moment. Yeah. Um, but for themselves and for their families, I think like most of us, they've become much more conservative. So you know, it's interesting you're saying in the, in the private jet space, I'm certainly seeing more interest from my clients in owning or long-term leasing private jets um, because previously where they might have been happy, um, you know, just phoning up a, well, getting their assistant to phone up a, you know, a, a private jet company and, and taking a private jet or even traveling commercial. Now they're obviously much more keen to make sure that, you know, they have control over the sanitary standards that are being applied to the aircraft and knowing who's on the plane with them and not wanting to travel with you know 300 other people even if when they got on the plane they turned left um so you know those kinds of things do i think come into it more um i think also in the same vein super yachts and have obviously become more popular as well so the second hand market in super yachts is absolutely booming um at least in my what i'm seeing around what my clients are looking to do um which is absolutely fascinating because Super Yachts was an industry that I had several clients um, who owned when we had the GFC, and that market died. I mean, it literally the bottom of the market. But people want control, as I say, over their environment, uh, and that's a way to get it. No, it's interesting because we, we see similarly the pre-owned market in particular on the business aviation side is just going gangbusters, has been probably since end of Q3 last year. And there's a shortage of, uh, of of aircraft, especially for the American market, which has bounced back pretty quickly. And, you know, it's the most mature market for business aviation anyway. And uh, we're seeing that um, demand and, and some of the bigger fleet operators even looking to pull in more um, older aircraft and even refurbishing them just to match the demand that they're, they're, they're seeing as well. Um, so that's interesting to hear your thoughts on that. We should maybe... Uh, talk about that offline off, uh, after these episodes. So just for carrying on on this uh, track, um, you know, you've mentioned sectors, we've mentioned a little bit about risk. Um, what about geographical factors and cultural factors? You touched upon it a little bit earlier about jurisdiction preferences. Um, has, is anyone vying uh, uh, coming up from, you know, from the more traditional areas or it's still more, more or less the same? And we touched a little bit before we came on about B&O and others, but I think obviously UK is always an attractive destination, but I'm talking more what a typical mid-shore would be these days rather than offshore. Sure. So the mid-shores um, in this part, well, I say this part of the world, obviously I'm in the UK, but I mean, you know, the, the Asian region, the mid-shores are still very much in my experience, Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, you know, Singapore has obviously done a fantastic job uh, of marketing itself as a family office jurisdiction and putting in some really, you know, innovative regulation around uh, family offices. Um, but it does, it still lacks the banking and um, equity and debt market infrastructure that Hong Kong has. So I still see, you know, a really good place for Hong Kong there. Um, the traditional offshore jurisdictions are still very, very popular. And actually I think um, it, you know, Cayman and BBI were obviously very, very popular for a long time in, uh, in Asia as, as true offshore jurisdictions. Um, and I would say predominantly that was uh, cost. They were more cost effective than your traditional offshore Channel Island, say, jurisdictions. Um, and also, uh, you know, there, there's so much expertise from BBI and Cayman in Hong Kong and Singapore that you can get local language advice in your time zone, it's a no brainer. Um, but I do see the traditional jurisdictions making a comeback. 
And I think that's because, you know, and uh, again, we spoke about this before we started recording, um, the, the OECD developments, the uh, increasing regulation that everyone is being subject to is meaning that uh, the, the lower cost jurisdictions are having to increase their costs. The service providers are having to increase their costs because they're subject to more and more regulatory and, um, uh, uh, and, and economic compliance. Um, you know, last year, for example, we saw economic substance filing um, in the Caribbean and other jurisdictions for the first time saying, look, you know, if you're saying you are in this jurisdiction, then you have to really be in this jurisdiction if you're in certain industries. That doesn't yet impact private investment holdings, um, but there's nothing to say that it won't in the future. So again, you know, previously we talked a little bit about taxonomy and, you know, hot off the press as it were from last week's discussions at G7, uh, they put out a communique that they were sort of in agreement that there should be some minimum target of 15% corporation tax now uh, and, and sort of tax at source. When do you feel, does this become a reality or what, what would be a typical timeline from here do you feel? Is it going to be five years or less or five years or more? Because obviously Russia and China is going to have a say in this as well. Look, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. The one I'm watching at the moment is Ireland because Ireland has a two point, sorry, 12.5% corporate tax rate and obviously has done incredibly well setting itself up as, you know, a mid short jurisdiction. And for the EU to pass any of this into law, Ireland will have to agree. Um, because of the way that you know the the the, the uh, EU works, so whether it ends up being fifteen percent, whether it ends up you know having to be negotiated down to twelve point five, I don't know. At the moment, I have to say I don't see this affecting families individually because this is very much aimed at the corporate tax side mm -hmm. of things. Um, what I am fascinated to see, I have to say, and I mean no disrespect is the former honourable senator from Delaware of all places being somebody who's now pushing um, tax transparency, uh, you know, corporate transparency, um, cop tax corporation, etc. I think, I think this is happening. I think um, as, uh, I think the, the, the tax uh, efficiency market and the, the planning and structuring that we did for corporate and families um, moving from the certainly from the GFC uh, you know we got it wrong right we misjudged the public mood um, and now I think we're going to see that this is the sort of next stage in that tightening um, but as to when this will happen I, I really couldn't say I have to say from the first murmurings from the OEC, well, not the first murmurings, but from the first real serious policy papers and you know white papers and so on that were coming out of the OECD only a few years ago, to this is much quicker than I was expecting. Um, but one thing I think that will have to be factored into all this is that as much as tax sovereignty is, is an issue, you know, absolutely, I respect every country's right to tax businesses and, and individuals in that jurisdiction, however they like, is the autonomy and freedom to not tax people. Again, you know, Hong Kong and Singapore, neither of those governments need any more tax revenue than they currently, than they currently earn. I mean, you and I both sit in Hong Kong where every yeah. year the financial secretary turns around and goes, actually, I don't need all my income tax revenue. So everybody have, you know, this year it was 10,000 Hong Kong dollars in prior years, it's been up to 30,000 Hong Kong dollars off your tax bill, because we'd rather you spent it in the economy, we don't need it. And we are a small um, government, uh, we run a small government philosophy, which is that actually consumers, uh, businesses and individuals are the best um, people to spend money in the economy, not government. So, so that's going to be an interesting um, discussion. I, I, but I do, I think something will happen, but in terms of your question as to when, I, I really wouldn't like to say. You touched, I mean, not in our pre-arranged questions here, but on the Channel Islands you talked about there, 
Guernsey, Jersey, where do they fit into this? You know, they've been, especially Guernsey, has it's it's had you know, quite, quite a long history of working with Chinese clients and Asian clients, um, but obviously still not the same numbers as a Cayman or Bermuda, the true offshores, when we, when we talk about the corporate side in particular, the shell companies that are formed on the Hong, Hang Seng and et cetera. Um, does Guernsey and Jersey, from your own position, you know, at uh, Praxis IP, IF, IFM, where, where do you see their advantage still when with all of that's going on? Um, look, I mean, I think it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. As I said before, one of the things that came and, and BBI and, and Bermuda to a certain extent do really well in Asia is they have experts on the ground. You know, you can go to... There are multiple law firms in most of the major midshore jurisdictions in Asia who have offshore specialists that you can deal with in your time zone, in your language, as I said. The service providers are all very, very familiar with them. The um, uh, accountants know how to do accounting to their standards. Um, it's very, very straightforward. And for some reason, Guernsey and Jersey just haven't um, done that and, and I don't know why I don't know but but you know having said that I do know Guernsey and Jersey practitioners in Hong Kong there's just fewer of who are very very good there's just fewer of them than there are the BBI Cayman and Bermuda um but uh look I think there's a real place for those jurisdictions I think something that people don't necessarily think about um when they're structuring but should be thinking about more in, if we look at you know the last year or so, what that's taught us is that you should plan for the unexpected and, and frankly plan for the worst. Um, they have more stable governments. They have um, uh, they have greater autonomy. They're you know still associated with the UK, but they're not you know as closely tied as BVI and Cayman. Last year there were murmurings that um, the British government was going to step in and appoint a, you know, someone, a, a direct rule over BVI. I think that's calmed down now, but it was certainly a possibility. Um, even before that, there was talk about the British government imposing uh, legislation and regulatory standards, again, on the BVI. I'm not picking on them, it was just them. Um, so, you know, Guernsey and Jersey, Isle of Man as well, don't, don't suffer from that. Um, they are they are ahead of the regulatory curve. And what's interesting is, you know, 10, 12 years ago, people who had structures in those jurisdictions were complaining about the regulatory burden there. But now everybody's up, up, up adhering to the same standards because they could see the writing on the wall and they just went, went preemptively rather than having to be told that this was an issue and ending up on somebody's blacklist or gray list. They just said, no, nope, we're gonna get there now. Um, from the legal perspective, you know, in uh, Guernsey and Jersey, I can have my choice of London um, senior counsel, you know, QC, that I want to argue my case. Um, and that person, well, in the good old days, would fly down for the day. It's only a 40 minute flight from London, um, do the hearing and then come back. Nowadays, at least it's in the same time zone. If you're trying to get someone to argue, you know, something, um, from London in the BVI, they're going to be working through the night, their time. Um, so it's, yeah, I really do think that they've got, um, I, I really do think they've got, uh, you know, certainly things to, 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 um, to encourage people to use them. They've brought in, they listen to what clients want. So they've brought in new purpose trust structures, new foundation structures, so they can offer a more civil law style um, offering a more sort of, if you like, Swiss or Liechtenstein uh, or Luxembourg style offering. Um, yeah, I think they're great little jurisdictions. Well, thank you. I mean, I was lucky enough also to get to Guernsey for an unrelated, uh, not to do a trust structure or anything, but it was more to do, again, my aviation background was helping a Chinese firm obtain an aircraft operating certificate, which uh, was with Guernsey, the two reg registry there in Guernsey, which uh, a lot of our listeners may not realize, but actually Guernsey's two reg is one of the largest jurisdictions for commercial aircraft coming off of leases. Uh, yeah. So aircraft like Airbus or Boeing coming off, say, a China Eastern lease and going to 
to China Southern. They have to come cleanly off the registry of China before going on to a new lessee's uh, fleet. So um, even if it's for 24 hours, you know, the two reg is what's being used typically, which is really, really fascinating. I didn't know that existed before, up until a few years ago. Good business if you can get it. Um, so just changing tax now, I would like to uh, focus, Joanne, a little bit on technology, um, because given the very personal nature of what you do with your clients, how is technology um, you know, facilitating or affecting the servicing side of the industry? Um, is it more addressing the back office functionality um, or, or is it you know, contributing more to the front of office? Well, the first aspect is, is obviously data security. That's the thing that, and it fascinated me um, five, six, seven years ago, I would bang this drum with my clients. So when I was a, when I was the lawyer in the room rather than the trustee, I would sit down with a client and I would say, right, we've got the proposal through from, you know, X trust company, but what do they say about data security and information security and where they store things and, and how all that works? And quite often the client wouldn't know. And so, you know, then you'd, you'd sort of push back a bit and, and find out a bit more from for them from um, the, the provider. Um, so I think, you know, particularly in the last few weeks, we've seen those massive, um, you know, ransom uh, hacks that we've had and, you know, serious consequences for global businesses. Um, families, family offices, and those of us who serve them could be seen as low hanging fruit. Now, we work really, really hard to make sure that's not the case. We have, you know, ex um, uh, intelligence agency uh, staff working for us, making sure that our networks are nice and secure. But um, that, that's obviously a key issue. The second issue for um, data security is making sure that you know how your data is used and managed. Um, you know, one of the things that the Trump administration didn't like, for example, about WeChat was the fact that everything runs as plain text through um, uh, Tencent servers. Um, and so everything is, you know, everything is, is readable. Now, I don't really have a, I don't really care what people do as long as they know how their data is being used and how it's being processed. And, you know, that this is a conscious decision on the client's part, that that's what they're doing and that's that they know where things are going. Um, in, in terms of the technology in our in our industry, obviously on the certainly as you say on the back office, it's a really you know great tool. Um, the other thing that's happened recently that I think is great is with people being stuck in different parts of the world and having to communicate remotely, clients have become a lot more comfortable with that. Mm. You know, going to the days where I would be summoned to you know sit in Mr. So and So's office, you know the chairman's office on the you know, 50 something floor looking out over Hong Kong Harbor, for example, is how it used to go. Now, literally we can Zoom or, you know, chat from anywhere and that's fantastic. Um, and, and people, although you mentioned at the beginning, we're all getting a bit Zoomed out. Um, it is very, very helpful. And it means you don't have to wait for everyone to be in the same place. Um, and you can still get business done, I think, at the beginning last year, there was a real, certainly in, in Hong Kong, what I saw was people saying, you know, look, this will all be over in a couple of weeks, if not a couple of months, like it was with SARS and we'll go back to normal. So the first half of last year, there were, I think there were a lot of meetings that were postponed. But certainly as we got into the second half of last year, you know, there's lots of regular meetings that would be scheduled, for example, invest annual investment reviews, annual trust reviews, um, those kinds of things, we can now do those virtually. And there's, you know, and it's just as useful and just as easy. And I'm, again, I'm sorry for the commercial airline um, representatives who listen to this because I think business travel's changed, if not forever, then certainly for the short to medium term, uh, where we won't feel pressured to get on an airplane to go attend that one meeting. Um, there will still be some where you have to, but we are building new relationships, even via technology. Um, the other thing, of course, and again, this, this is, applies to all of us, is people's children are changing the way they look at technology and how they use technology. 
Um, so, you know, there are some great uh, providers out there who will um, give, give high net worth families an indication of what data can be found on the family in the public domain. And I hate to say it, but it's the children who are the worst offenders because if they forget to turn off their geotagging in their photographs, I mean, again, less of an issue now, we're not traveling so much, but there was one guy who was incredibly um, uh, quiet, shall we say, and, and you know, private about where he was and what he was doing and, and all the rest of it, which was fantastic. But then his daughter was snapping selfies on the Champs-Élysées when she was in Paris for Fashion Week. So, <laughs> um, you know, so, so that kind of, uh, you know, just sort of, sort of getting the generations to work together and getting people to understand the consequences of, of what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, there, there was an issue actually going back, keeping it on aviation for a second, about the tracking of uh, tails in America. They were trying to bring that out as a legal requirement to share that in the public domain. I think there was an element of disclosure allowed now, but it's still, they, were, they pushed back on security grounds because obviously, um, you know, you could, if you wanted to sort of track particular business leaders, they would, if you know where they're going, you could predict a deal that could happen, you know, and it could affect markets and stuff. Um, but, okay, so um, I guess talking in, not in tongues, but like sort of talking about the impact of things, um, social impact, good governance, you know, you've, you've touched upon it as well earlier in your conversation. The requirements now typically, especially Hong Kong, Singapore jurisdictions on ESG reporting, it's been around for a number of years, but but you would have thought it had just come out like that's because it's just become the hot thing, but it's been around for five, five years or so, but more and more exchanges are now making it mandatory. Uh, and I think also there's much more, um, if you like, uh, exploration, uh, sort of forensic analysis of what these ESG reports contain rather than being a tick box, tick box exercise. Are these real, uh, investments that the uh, and offsets that the um, corporation is doing is the family office becoming more and more conscious of all of this I guess they would in their equity investments but what about just non-public stuff is it making them think and is the structures changing in terms of trusts language including you know some of the language in some of the legal contracts uh, alluding to all of this I think it is. I think um, as active, well, I think there's a couple of things here. First of all, high net worth families around the world have always been incredibly philanthropic. Um, and I think that is something that doesn't go, that isn't as recognized as, as, as much as it should be. Um, and some have chosen to do it publicly. Some have chosen to do it privately. Um, but I would also say that the, philanthropic and, um, uh, and, and social impact investing and all that has also become more sophisticated as people who are by background, you know, if you like pure play bankers and investment brokers have moved into that space. So, um, you know, you're now seeing social impact bonds and, and you know, in basically insurance project products and so on. Um, that high net worth families can get into. I mean, I've got a couple of, um, of my clients have invested with, you know, international organisations like UNICEF, like the Red Cross. Um, so that's certainly becoming more sophisticated. The other thing that I think is happening is that um, activist investors are becoming more um, sophisticated too, and that's changing things. So, you know, when we saw the collapse of Arcadia last year, you know, that Philip Green was absolutely vilified. So I think families are starting to see that even if they're minority shareholders in, um, in companies, they can be massively impacted by, you know, saying you're involved in this and you're involved in that. I mean, just to give you an example, there was a, a, an article, it was very small, but there was an article in one of the British papers a couple of weeks ago about someone complaining that uh, Microsoft wanted to um, 
replace their entire laptop because the webcam had stopped working. And the point of the article was to say, how does this fit with Bill Gates's, um, you know, sustainability and green um, goals for himself and his uh, foundation and, and everything. And so I think that level of sophistication that we're seeing um, on the on the, the, the push factor, if you like, is also encouraging this kind of positive feedback loop where family offices and, and high net worth individuals are having to become more and more sophisticated in terms of what they invest in and how they invest personally. You know, it's one thing to invest through a fund into something so that it's never going to be linked back to the family. But when the family is starting to buy shares in a group, or you know, they're the significant shareholder because they were the ones who listed it, it becomes more and more important, um, I think. And I think, you know, consumer, we've seen worldwide, you know, China with what happened with the European um, and American fashion brands who said they were no longer going to buy cotton from Xinjiang, you know, the huge backlash that they faced, but then they had their consumer backlash in the US and Europe if they hadn't said that they weren't going to buy that cotton. So some of the, and some of these businesses are family owned, right? Um, still, even to this day, some of those sportswear brands. So the family has to be more sophisticated and the advisors um, that they hire both in their family office and externally have to be more sophisticated. And this is where I think it comes back to that, um, you know, 10 factor model that, that I've talked about in my recent article that you, as an advisor, you can't just think, okay, this is a great financial return. We should absolutely invest in this. You know, you have to think about what's this going to look like front page on the Financial Times above the fold on a Monday morning um, and see, you know, you know and, and consider that. Yeah, well, it's interesting you touched upon that because um, we were doing something recently with Imperial College and uh, the 48 Club, uh, which is a Chinese uh, recognized um, think tank, if you like, in, in London. And one of their recent, well, one of their observations where I found really interesting was that they said, if you're a Western company now in today's world, if you don't have a strategy of having a regional headquarters in Asia that is separate to your the rest of the world, as it were, has the autonomy to deal in the market, in some ways it's that dual circulation that's been announced by China, um, that you're going to have to have two strategies. If you want to be in the major markets in Asia, which is pretty much China, mainland, um, it, it's a completely different and maybe ring-fenced subsidiary of the global headquarters and, and in some ways has to have the powers for China to allow you to do what you're doing because it needs to go by the local rules and not the global rules. So um, it's interesting, you know, that companies now are going to have to, you know, especially the conglomerates are going to have to really, uh, if they haven't done it already, I mean, a lot of the banks do that already, but, you know, as we go down the food chain, you know, there's still companies today trying to rule the roost from London HQ or New York HQ. And it, and it typically also demotivates some of the local team who are coming up against uh, local regulation and yet they're getting bashed by headquarters. Why are you not meeting your targets, you know? <laughs> Uh, because it's not China for China model. You know, so for example, um, you know, imagine you're a you're a you're a, a Silicon Valley headquartered uh, company, and you're very much into supporting LGBT uh, rights, for example, and you know you make a big song and dance about it. So you tell your Indonesian subsidiary that they've got to make a big song and dance during you know, um, LGBT recognition week or on International AIDS Day or something like that, you know, the, the Indonesian subsidiary is gonna turn around and go, that's great, but what you're asking us to do is A, not culturally sensitive and B, illegal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. You know, you've got to let us let us run this for ourselves, and then there will be other things that'll that will be the other way around. And I think one thing we're learning in this more um, immediately interconnected world, if I can say, where perhaps middle level staff.
staff and, and you know, lower level staff, I didn't, because it would have been senior management flying into meetings with other people, is they're starting to recognize things like, you know, if you do business in the Middle East, don't organize meetings on a Friday. Um, if you, uh, you know, if you're doing business in China, forget getting any work done during Chinese New Year. Um, you know, all, all this sort of thing. I mean, my CFO, my global CFO was delighted to find out that, um, you know, it's bad luck uh, to carry debt over from one year to the next in China. So, you know, he was like, fantastic. I know every year I'm gonna get a big bump of cash in <laughs> from the Asian operations in that week. So, you know, in terms of where the finance team focuses their debt collection e efforts in those two weeks before Chinese New Year, it's gonna be those China clients. Yeah, that's a really good point. So we're coming towards the end of the chat. It's been fascinating so far, Joanna. And just two quick things really, and you know, if you can keep it a bit shorter, but how is your sector, you know, now coming to sort of your other responsibilities you mentioned at the society level? How are you looking to attract new young talent into the segment that you're in? Because it's fairly niche still, right? Um, in terms of that area. And what are the career development opportunities if you know, we have some of our younger audience here as well. And, and then lastly, just along that lines, what is what is the latest at Praxis IFM? Um, you know, how is that how is that offering uh, being attracted or is attracting the Asian clientele seeking your service? So make, you know, a quick plug, if you may. <laughs> so firstly about the young talent and then a bit about Praxis. Um, so one of the things, yeah, so I mean, so look, um, I'm actually, I've actually recently become the, um, the step uh, chair for Hong Kong. So I'm very, very grateful to be in that, given that opportunity. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And actually, um, in terms of the organization, I'm one of the younger uh, members. So you're absolutely right. We need to attract more young talent. And the, the two things that I always say to people is one, if you like people and you like helping people, this is a great way to do that, right? As you said, you know, it's a real privilege to work with families and solve problems for families at all levels of society. And by doing it, you know, in a paid capacity for high net worth and ultra high net worth families, you learn skills that you can then apply, um, you know, in a voluntary basis to other families who might not be able to afford your uh, services. And that's what I do personally. Um, and then the other aspect of it is, sure, go in and work for, you know, uh, just picking an example off my head, top of my head, Alibaba, right? Absolutely go in there and work with Alibaba. But wouldn't it be more fun to work in Jack Ma's family office and have actual direct, you know, um, ability to engage with him directly, not just in terms of what he's doing, you know, Alibaba or Alipay or any of those things, but actually where he sees things going five, 10, 15 years down the line across all sectors and across all industries, um, and, and that insight and um, is, is a real privilege. You know, families are opening themselves up to you uh, in a way that you won't get in the corporate environment. I mean, I appreciate you said keep this keep this short, but when I was when I was um, a junior lawyer, as I said, I worked at this really prestigious New Zealand law firm that just dealt with private client work. I then moved to another firm that was a full service corporate firm. And one of my male colleagues said to me, um, you know, why are you doing this? You don't want to get pigeonholed as a woman who does, you know, family law and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And I remember saying to him, I said, look, your files are so boring. You don't want to read them. I've seen that bundle of expert evidence on that roading dispute you're doing. And it sat on your shelf for six or eight weeks and you haven't even opened it. My files are literally in Hello magazine. You know, <laughs> my client rang me up week to say have you seen the interview my ex-wife has done you know in the the sunday lifestyle magazine so there's that um <laughs> then in terms of what we do look i i think there's still a lot of room and um a lot of work to be done on the structuring side you know in asia at the moment we're going through a massive transfer of wealth from one generation to the next and depending on your ju your jurisdiction um it's from you know founder to second or third uh, or um, founder looking to set it up so that it's ready for second or third gen when they're old enough to take things over. 
So there's a huge thing, huge a lot happening there. And I would say to anyone who's um, who's listening and looking at this for themselves or their clients, choose a provider that you think you can work with for the long term. So look at things like, you know, what's their ownership structure? We're listed. So our ownership structure is, first of all, very clear. Secondly, very stable. Some others in the industry are owned by private equity. That has its advantages. They have huge cash pools. They can do, you know, lots of new fangled things. But it also means that the ownership structure or, or owner may change very quickly. They may be bought up by a bigger PE back, backer. They may list. Um, they may go, you know, may be a some a kind of management buyout. Those things happen. What is the staff longevity? You know, we keep staff on average across the group for more than eight years. So somebody who picks up the phone today to their advisor knows that they'll be speaking to them in, you know, five, six, seven years. It'll be the same person. It's not going to change four times in two years. Um, what is their insurance coverage like? As I said before, what's their data security? How available is their senior management? If you've got a question or a, a comment, how many clients do each, does each advisor look after? You don't want to be explaining yourself two or three times about, you know, we had this conversation last week, why can't you remember? Um, what language capabilities do they have? Uh, what's their strategy for growth? If, if you're somebody who's saying, right, I want, you know, I'm, I'm only interested in giving you my private client work. Do you want somebody for whom private client isn't their main focus as a business? Because that way, you know, you know you're not gonna get the attention and the resources that you would get from somebody where it is. Um, so, you know, all those kinds of things, I think, are factors that people should be thinking about when they're looking at, at who they talk to. Well, I had the pleasure of meeting with Cindy and uh, Novia in Hong Kong not too many weeks ago at your office. Um, and they were wonderfully insightful as well. And so I just um, want to say, you know, Praxis is obviously also supporting women leaders, which I also love to advocate as well. I think it's very important to bring on more female leaders in Asia. Uh, it was one of the great observations I had as well when I first moved here 13 years ago was that uh, it was great to see so many uh, young ladies in the service sectors of importance in the high net worth individual sector. So long may it continue. And I just want to now um, say a big thank you, Joanna, for joining us on a sunny afternoon from London along the River Thames uh, to myself here along Victoria Harbour in uh, the dark side of Hong Kong. <laughs> so with that, um, we'll say goodbye to uh, Joanna. And that concludes our episode of The Value Prop. Thanks for joining us. And please join us once again in a short time uh, for our next episode. So bye bye for now. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michael. The Value Prop Show is brought to you by PBIC, the Pacific Basin Economic Council. Your co-hosts are Miguel Aboites and Michael Walsh from PBEC. You can follow us and subscribe on our LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. Thanks for watching and listening, and see you in the next episode.